Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Send me a message in the chat if anyone's got any problems with that. Um, but I'm Steph from Simply Rhino, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, which focuses on V-Ray for Rhino in product design. This webinar has been put together in the run-up to Chaos Group's presence at the Rhino UK user group meeting, which takes place next week on Tuesday, June the 9th in London. More details on the meeting and Chaos Group's presence at it can be found on the event webpage on the Simply Rhino website, which is simplyrhino.co.uk. Today's online masterclass will go through advanced workflow for creating complex and real-life based light setups and shaders. Industry-proven tools such as V-Ray Dome Light, V-Ray Area Light, V-Ray Advanced and Physical Camera will help complete the workflow. Today's webinar should last approximately 40 minutes and our presenter is Vassil, a CG specialist from Chaos Group. Vassil is a 3D professional with experience in the field of 3D modeling, texturing and rendering. If you've got any questions as we proceed through the, today's webinar, then please type them in and send them to us. It's most likely we'll answer these in a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar is also being recorded, so it can be watched again and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. We'll make a link to that available as soon as we can. So thank you to Chaos Group and especially to Vassal, to whom I'll now hand over. Over to you, please, Vassal. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Today's webinar um, will be focused on how do we build our light setups on different product design geometries and uh, how do we create complex materials that will resemble or uh, mimic uh, real world uh, physical properties of different types of materials such as plastics or metals or uh, some kind of uh, refractive surfaces as well. So. <clears throat> Without uh, further ado, I will, I will start with um, breaking down this helmet. So I, I just want to make sure that we are on the right track here. I will be using only V-Ray RT, not the production render, because when you install and use V-Ray, whether, uh, whether it's uh, this version or other version, you always get two render engines. This will be the production render and the real-time render engine. Now, the real-time render engine is <clears throat> production quality render engine, which supports nearly all features of the production one. So it will be much faster for me to just focus on creating the shaders and the lights rather than uh, hitting render all over again. Okay, so let's, uh, <clears throat> you know, I have uh, set up a few uh, light setups here. One is with the dome light and the other one is with several lights. But what I did, just uh, so I try if it's uh, good enough to mix them both, I actually did mix them, and I'm using a dome light as my fill and overall ambient lighting, and I also have my lights, which are contributing to extracting some highlights from my geometry. So let's uh, turn the lights off, and here is the dome light. So let's uh, select my uh, dome light. There we go, and let's enable it. Okay, uh, you know, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to start all over again, guys, just uh, to make sure that we are, on the, we are following all the steps. So let me turn off this. And uh, one of the easy ways to actually add your ambient lighting will be to simply use our uh, V-Ray Express toolbar. So let's uh, create this one. There we go. So this is one light setup, really easy. Just place it and you have all your lights over there. Now what you can do is you can select this dome light and start tweaking it so I can uh, boost the intensity so it matches my current uh, camera exposure or I can adjust the camera exposure. Uh, let's say I'm not happy with this one, I can of course turn it off and uh, what I can do is I can create a new one. So there we go, it's a different one. So I can have all, of, let, okay, let's rename actually this one. Okay, let's rename the layer and call it, let's just put numbers. And uh, instead of using this one, I will just create a new one, just to give it a try. There we go. Now this one is obviously uh, dimmer than the other one, so I just boost the lighting. 
And of course, the cool thing with this uh, this type of uh, setting up your lights is that it's uh, very easy to manage where the lights are coming from because this is not like it's uh, a locked uh, light setup. It's really flexible, so I can just select my <coughs> Uh, don't like the texture and I can start rotating it there we go it's starting to show up on that side maybe we can uh, rotate it even further there that's really nice now so this is one really really simple and easy way to uh, do it so let's rename this one as well and the cool thing that is everything is created in its own layer so you can keep it and have different uh, types of setups made for just in case. So let's create an image based lighting. Now, this will be a real world image that's being converted to HDRI and it uh, has spherical mapping. So we can uh, map it to a, a dome light. So let's rotate it, let's say 90 degree, just to have a look of the light. So, it, as you can see, it's really looking very realistic. Let's put it to uh, 10, and okay, maybe that's too much. Let's put it down here. Uh, what we can do is we can make it visible. There we go. If you have a backplate or the dome light that you have is, uh, the HDRI, excuse me, that you have is with a really nice image, uh, you can use it as a background as well. Now what I can do guys is actually I can mix a few dome lights here uh, since this is my uh, new one so let's, uh, let's call it IBL image based lighting because there is a actual image there not just uh, black and white planes uh, mapped on a, on a texture what I can do is I can stop this dome light from affecting my actual light and use it only for the reflection. So now this dome light is being used, this texture, only for having it nicely on my reflections. Uh, so now I can go to another uh, one of these dome lights that I have that had the actual texture from here. And uh, I think this one was really nice. So let's put this one and uh, this is the new one so let's call it new and now what I will do is I will turn it off from affecting the the lighting actually the reflections excuse me because the other one was uh, stopped from lighting it and now I have two separate dome lights each one uh, taking care of different parts of my uh, scene one is taking care of the reflections and the other one is taking care of the lighting without interfering uh, in each other's path. So this is really cool, uh, really interesting thing that you can do to achieve uh, certain uh, effects. So let's turn that off <clears throat> and uh, I will do a manually one. Um, <clears throat> so let's create a dome light. You can create your own dome light from over here. There we go. Now this is plain white uh, light coming from uh, the dome light. It's uh, it's really easy to use it. I can turn it off from the visibility. So there we go. We have a black uh, environment now, but we can use uh, any environment over here in the background. So I can place, let's say, a bluish. And now that I make the dome light invisible, I will be seeing this one. I can plug a follow-up, for example. I can plug any kind of texture. So, for example, I can select this one and just place it screen so it faces towards me. And there we go. So this is a really simple way of working with product design shots where you want to have mix different types of lighting and uh, visibility objects. So let's select the dome light again. And this time, instead of emitting plain white color, I will add <clears throat> my own HDRI. So 
just select bitmap and I have this kitchen. I will switch the environment, keep the spherical and there we go. So this I can make it visible all over again so we can see what's going on. So you can see that it's making these really nice reflections, really, really realistic reflections that I wanted in the first place to have. So that's a very, very easy and realistically looking way of lighting your scene. If you have the proper uh, HDRI images, you can really easily light your scene. So the V-Ray Express toolbar gives you this functionality without any special preparation. So let's turn off <clears throat> my dome light. Let's turn it off. And uh, let's create an exterior. There we go. So this is a completely different uh, look and feel than the previous one. <clears throat> uh, OK, so this was one of the ways that you could achieve a very fast and efficient way of lighting your scene. But what I want to show you guys is working with the area lights. Now, I will turn on again my dome light. But this time, I will set this to zero so it doesn't emit any light. And we'll enable the lights. So these lights I created previously, but uh, what I will do is I will, I'm just showing you guys to see the goal where I want to go now. But I will start from scratch. So let's turn that off. So the first thing that I want to do, guys, is to start with a simple plane light which will show me and define me the, <clears throat> the shape of my geometry. So let's uh, select the light. There we go. Now, of course, this is really, really plain setup, which is not what I'm after. Now what I want to do is I want to start following the shape of my helmet. So I will just place it over here and we'll try and get some highlights from these edges. These are really nice edges that I want to uh, just follow along and uh, be able to show to the people what, what nice edges my helmet has. So I will just uh, place it over here. And this is a start, just a plain uh, area light. One thing that I really like when, uh, when I use uh, plain lights is adding a texture to simulate a softbox. This is really simple. Just add a bulge texture. This is how it looks like. Just remember that it will low, lower the intensity of your <coughs> of your area light. So you need to compensate it with some more intensity. So let's uh, increase that. Keep in mind that what I want to achieve is nice fall off on the edges, at the edges of the end of this area light. So let's uh, place it over here. Now one thing that I'm missing currently is the overall rim light that's really really useful in these cases so let's create a very large light this time I will rotate it there we go so now obviously I'm seeing this light so I don't want to see it I'll turn that off and there we go we have something to begin with now obviously this is really uh, really a, uh, intense light so I'll just uh, lower it down but first I want to keep it that way and position it accordingly so I get I can get the proper uh, highlights where I want them to be there we go and uh, okay so now I will just start lowering the intensity so let's try with 20 maybe 10. Now keep in mind the bigger the light the more intensity it emits so there's uh, 
it's pretty normal what we have now. One thing that I can do is add again the bulge texture so I can get some fall off over here. And back to maybe 20. There we go. Now this is looking much, much better. So let's continue. Now what I want to do is just uh, copy and paste this light over here so we can have something going on in, at the front on the actual helmet. And there we go. So this is a really, really simple way of lighting the scene. Now, obviously, we have some very dark areas over here, which is uh, not what we want. So I will try and fix that. First of all, I will copy and paste this light. And uh, OK, just let me select this. There we go. And let's place it over here. Yeah, that's that's a lot, guys. So I will just uh, make it smaller. It, I don't need it to be that big here at the bottom. OK, just let me rotate it a bit. And now, of course, let's make it very, very subtle. We just want to fill that area so it's not that dark as it was. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, I don't like this really, really strange highlight here on the top. So I will try and work with that. I will try and fix it. So first, I want to uh, put that to object. Now. Obviously, it's, uh, it's something that I can fix by just positioning the light accordingly. And now the next step will be to simply just, just a moment, guys, so I can position it right. And uh, okay, now let's again switch to object, make it a little bit smaller. It doesn't need, necessarily need to be that big. And uh, what we can do now, guys, is just place it over here. So now that's that looks much, much uh, better. There we go. And I think the final light that I will be placing is one on the top, so we have more light on, on the top in general. Now this is again something that I'm building from scratch just so I can have a look and feel of what I want to achieve with my uh, my product here. Of course, uh, you can use uh, predefined setups, which I will show you in a moment. So now obviously I have uh, this light as well placed and uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, what I have done is I have a light setup done in less than 10 minutes. Actually, I have several light setups done in less than uh, maybe 15 minutes. OK, let's be uh, honest. And this is really cool because now I can select my dome light, which was uh, set to 0. And I can put it, Let's OK, let's just place 10 so we can really see what's going on. So let's uh, make it invisible first. And let's lower the intensity. We don't need this overblown uh, image. Now, of course, I am contributing the entire scene with area lights and a dome light, which is maybe too much right now as, it, as intensity. So I will lower the dome light. I just want to have it set up. But, you know, the light is uh, overblown, but the reflections are all right. So what I will do is, is I will duplicate the dome light. I will use this dome light only for the reflections, and I will use this dome light only for the diffuse or the light. 
So this one will emit reflections and this one will emit light. Basically, I will lower the light intensity a lot and uh, maybe I need to lower just a little bit the reflection intensity. So now I have complete flexibility, the highlights where I want them, the reflections how much I want them, and the overall ambient light how much I want. So this is really, really cool, uh, really nice thing that you can achieve by using the dome light along with all these area lights. Of course, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's turn off this dome lights. And uh, I want to show you that besides image-based lighting based on dome lights, we can have also a lot of uh, predefined light setups. So let's turn off all the lights. We have no lights at all here in the scene. And as you can see, we have studio lighting. So let's select this one. And there we go. Now, this is obviously pretty huge. And I, I think it's intended for a much, much bigger uh, product design shots than this one. Uh, but the cool thing is that it adds its own layer. Uh, just like with the dome lights, you can keep it. Or if you click on the next one or whatever one you choose, it replaces the existing one. And there we go. Now, this is much more appropriate for the current helmet. Uh, of course, you can uh, rotate the entire setup. These are actual area lights, so you can do anything you want with them. You can have multiple textures inside of them, so this is a softbox texture placed inside the actual area light. So it's really cool. Okay, let's select the next one. There we go. <coughs> this is a completely different setup. So based on your needs and based on what you want to achieve, guys, you can have all these different types of light setups. Now, obviously, um, I want to get back to my setup. Let's just try a different one just so we can have something interesting out of the box for this helmet. Um, maybe this one, but you know, okay, let's uh, let's turn this off and I will just turn on my light setup here and uh, let's keep it for now. What I want to do guys is show you that uh, we can also start working with some materials that are predefined over here as well as, well as we can work on something that's uh, already built or we can build ourselves. Now these are uh, Visma materials that we can use. For example, I can take this glass-like helmet and get over here, clear glass, black, blue, blue tinted. Okay, let's add the blue tinted to this one. And there we go. Now this is a regular V-Ray material. Let's have a look here. There it is, glass, blue tinted, but obviously it's not that uh, transparent as much as I want it. So let's select a different one, light green. And as you can see, it's creating its own material over here, which you can edit at any time. So this is the cool thing. But another cool thing is that these materials, the way you see them, you can have your own by simply just get over here and save the material. So I can save my material. and uh, <clears throat> It's uh, something that you can share with different projects and uh, different people. Now, what I want to talk about mostly here, guys, is this material which I created using several uh, layers of diffuse and several layers of reflection to achieve something like uh, flakes. So this is, okay, just a moment, over here. You know, okay, let's recreate it all over again. It will be fun. Create standard material. I use the standard material 
uh, over the new BRDF material just because I'm used to and just because I it makes more sense to me when creating the layers but anyway it's pretty much the same so it doesn't really matter so I'll call this new material and uh, okay so let's start working on this one uh, first of all I want to uh, just create something really really dark as base material as base color please excuse me and maybe not so saturated maybe more desaturated I don't know yet but I, I'm just trying different types of uh, look and feel okay so let's uh, create a new diffuse layer uh, obviously I want the new one to get on top of the old one there we go and this one will be more saturated actually just more vivid much more vivid and now what I want to do is I want to blend them in a certain way and that will be based on Fresnel so what I will do guys is I can invert those and set that to something higher and there we go based on my viewing angle I'm having two different types of color one will be the darker the other one will be the lighter that's what I want to achieve now of course we can work with the colors as well so if I go to darker values I'm getting more from uh, the upper and if I go to lighter values I'm going more to the one at the bottom so let's keep it this way uh, maybe the Fresnel uh, I should say 1.4 to make the fall off uh, more sudden and now you know guys let's add a reflection layer just so we can have a better idea of what's going on wow that's really sharp reflections that's not something that I want I will just uh, create a really wide highlight now keep in mind that those two should usually go uh, with the same values I wouldn't make this and this with different values because physically accurately they should be locked together and uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't unlock them unless I want to achieve something really really specific uh, okay so what I want now is um, to give my reflection some color some tint but it's really really subtle there we go it's starting to look really nice now let's get back to adding some flakes oops now that's better uh, so my final diffuse which you're seeing right now I will just select this and uh, <clears throat> you know one way would be to just uh, just create a color okay let's let's just go with a color the color of the flakes that I want to have will be here there we go and here I will just mask it so I will use okay the stucco as a mask so the only thing that you need to find out right now is uh, actually it needs to be inverted and we need to just figure out the size the size of this and of course the thickness and there we go it's starting to give me these nice flakes of course these are really gigantic right now so the size 
Uh, okay, let's try with repeat it. Let's see if we repeat it two times. So it's, uh, let's have a look what the effect will be. Nice. Uh, okay, so let's repeat it. Uh, let's put it to uh, five times repetition. Cool. Maybe more. We need that. Uh, okay, let's just for now set it to 10. And uh, the next step that I will be doing <coughs> is add a new reflection layer, a brand new reflection layer just for the flex so they can have their own reflection amount. Now this will be really, really fun to create. Uh, so generally we need to take these values, okay this one we don't need now, uh, and just replicate them. 0 0.02, 0 0.01, 10, 10. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just go to my filter Uh, I'll just double check them later and uh, here here we go so now we are emitting additional reflectivity only over there which is with the same values as the ones that are actually the flakes but this time I will put the Fresnel that is more for metallic looking. Okay, so you can see now that it's with like actual flakes. And of course the final part will be to add the clear coat, the coating. You can rename those any way you want. And uh, keep in mind, I don't believe that there should be anything with 1.0. It's just far too much. And uh, maybe the overall amount can be lowered as well. And there we go. So this is uh, one way of doing a complex material that you want to uh, make it resemble the look and feel of something in reality. So this is really cool way of doing it. Uh, another material that uh, was really fun to recreate was the aluminum. Now these aluminum parts are uh, something that I learned that they exist. They're different, just uh, iodized aluminum, I guess. I'm not really sure, but uh, it's really fun to recreate those aluminum uh, materials. So let's uh, duplicate this one. And uh, this time, instead of bluish, I uh, will create a yellowish one. So let's apply it. <coughs> and uh, okay, let's uh, now. Now the first thing that you need to know, guys, when you create a metal, is that it almost doesn't rely on diffuse. The diffuse is just the base where you will see on your geometry only where the reflections are. Uh, fading out. So the first thing that you need to pay attention to is just make the diffuse at the beginning black so you, it doesn't interfere with your uh, overall look of the material and then just work with the filter. So now I will create something like this. Okay, that's uh, I think too much saturated maybe like this and uh, the glossiness maybe you will find very interesting to work with because it all depends on the glossiness the Fresnel amount and the filter so these three parameters basically will control what you see and what you do with your reflections okay so let's just create a little bit of tint to our very dark diffuse and there we go. Now 
we did some lighting, we did some shading, but one of the most important things when you do product design shots is also the camera settings. So I have another scene, guys, which is uh, this uh, snowboard. And one of the things that really make this scene interesting is that I'm shooting it with a camera with camera settings, but the, the difference between doing it this way or without it is really massive. So let's uh, turn off the physical camera and start rendering. There we go. Now this is the normal camera that we are taking from the Rhino. As you can see, it's uh, it doesn't have any depth of field. It's just a plain rendering of what we see in the scene. Now I can move around. Oops. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> now what I can do is actually I can stop that. I can set how many millimeters that will be. Um, okay, let's get back to a camera. Once you have set up your point of view, one of the very important things is to render it as you're actually making a shot with your DSLR. This is one of the things that I found really useful is that you have to think like you're doing photography. This really helps, guys. Now, okay, let's, uh, let's enable the physical camera. As you can see, I am matching what I see in the viewport with what I uh, do here in my physical camera. Obviously, this depth of field I have achieved by enabling my depth of field. There are two ways of setting up where you want your focus point to be. One would be by setting up a override focal distance, which is really simple. Uh, you just have to know the distance between your point of view and the geometry that you want to be on focus. Or the other way would be to, if you disable that, to just select the target and point where you want, and this is where your focus will be. Really simple. No uh, additional steps are required. Now, as you can see, we have all the necessary parameters for an actual DSLR. If I disable the veneering, my corners all, all of a sudden will be really bright as if there is none. If I start adding, let's uh, add some more guys. So you can see how dark here it has become. Okay, so um, I can zoom in additionally. Uh, or zoom out. So this is really fun to work with. I really enjoy working with the physical camera because it's giving me additional flexibility, additional optionality to work with my scenes. So as you can see, this is uh, the complete scene right now. Uh, <clears throat> what I can do is uh, I can work with my F number to uh, just, just how much depth of field I have just so I can emphasize on my product. So 5.6 will of course make it darker just like in real world and the depth of field, the, the blurred areas will be less blurred. So I can easily compensate that with uh, the film speed or with the shutter speed. So this is uh, something really interesting. I can distort Okay, let's distort it even more. There we go. So it's uh, I'm just distorting my uh, my film, just like in real world you have distortion from the lens. I can shift the lens. There we go. So you can have all these really, really weird effects with your physical camera without actually tempering with your uh, with your scene, which is something that I really enjoy doing because 
Uh, sometimes I create my project, I do everything right, but in the end, it, it's not that interesting. It's not that uh, catchy as I first imagined it. So then once I add some uh, additional uh, physical camera effects like this, like adding depth of field, like distorting a little bit the image, adding some vignette, uh, it all of a sudden starts to look really, really interesting. So that's something that I really enjoy. Uh, you know what, let's, uh, let's uh, return to the original and what I will do is I can change also the white balance. So this is also something I can do. So add, let's add more vignette and um, you know maybe not this, but this way. There we go. So um, I guess the, my time is up. So if you have any questions, I'll be here to answer them. <clears throat> Hi there, Vassal. Uh, hi, Steph. Hi, yeah. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to hand over to Paul, actually. I think we've got um, a question or two. Um, and if anyone's got any other ones, then please send them over. Um, so I'm going to mute myself and um, over to Paul. Thanks, Steph. Hi, Basil. Hi, Paul. Okay. Um, Sorry for the background noise. Um, right, there is a question here, but I want to encourage, if anyone's got any other questions, please forward them over right now. But I'll get, I'll get the question that I have for you, Vassil, is um, I think this was on the first, yes, it was, it related to the first part of your uh, presentation and the, the helmet. Um, how was the material mapped so evenly over the organic shape of the helmet? It's a question from Rob. Uh, you're referring to uh, just to this part here or this one? I think that's one. Yes, I'm nope. sure that's what Rob means. The triangles, right? Yeah. Well, okay. Let let me uh, tell you a secret. First of all, I I made the texture for the snowboard. This is it. Then uh, actually, I really loved it, so I created all over again in Photoshop. I just did this. Uh, just replicate it three times so I can get a square and then what I did here is actually I added a spherical mapping I just add a spherical mapping to this helmet as you can see it's a little bit distorted over here but it doesn't look bad at all so uh, let me just stop the other render this one and <clears throat> start rendering here so I can show you so basically a, I created a square map for this I added a spherical mapping for the helmet and I just uh, did some tiling so let me just show you oops just a moment guys Actually, I will get rid of this, and here you can see the scene. But of course, you can position it to the exact place where this scene will not be visible. So it's really uh, simple to achieve. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Basil. Um, yeah, a few more questions have come in. Um, I think this is a kind of kind of general question, um, but. How do you optimize the rendering settings to make faster renders? I think that's quite a big question. Um, but um, yeah, qu that question's from Mikhail. Uh, okay, so let me open this all uh, over again, mm. <clears throat> just so I make sure it's with my default settings. And I guess you're referring for the production render rather than the RT render, because the RT uh, does not have any uh, optimization. It just renders uh, infinitely. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, when we consider that here we have mostly reflections and highlights, one thing that we need to generally understand is that we don't need much GI. We can actually render with very little GI settings. 
So what I will do, guys, is I will select brute force as my primary engine and light cache as my secondary engine. This is for the production. And then in the uh, image sampler, I will start with something really low as settings. Uh, maybe even that low. So let's just hit render with brute force and light cache. There we go. I think that's quite fast for now. Yeah. But of course, it's uh, noisy, so um, there is not much that we can do now, but uh, start to optimize it. Obviously, I'm going to draw a region so we don't waste time on the entire image. And uh, the one thing that I will start working on is uh, start adding more precision to the image sampler because I believe that th there are only two places that our noise is coming from. First, this is the image sampler because the anti aliasing is not very good, so this is responsible for that. And the second one is the GI, which is over here. Obviously, the brute force is not doing very good job with this, uh, this amount of subdivision. So let's start fixing those two. And there we go, it's starting to look better and we're still not waiting a whole lot of time. So let's uh, just go to 1, 2 and maybe just 10. Let's render. Almost there. Now obviously the final part of uh, the rendering would be to fix the brute force. Just a moment, guys. And uh, let's just add 20 subdivisions. And render. As you can see, it's uh, slower, but the quality will be perfect. And there we go. This right. is the simplest way of optimizing the render settings for uh, your rendering because there are three places of quality that you can look for. The image quality, the image sampling quality or the anti-lasing, the shading quality, which uh, in this case is not a big deal, and the GI quality. So uh, if you, for some reason, have noise in the reflections, all you have to do is just uh, multiply this by 2 or by 3 just to add more subdivisions to all the materials and all the lights. Or go locally, for example, here and in each reflection layer, just add more subdivisions to the reflections. Great. Thanks, Vasil. Okay. Um Different question. Can the radius of the focal blur be adjusted? Mm, the radius of uh, the focal blur, do you mean the depth of field? I'm not sure. It's a question from Rob here. I, he, yes. Okay, just confirmed. Yes, that is what he means. Yes. Well, the radius is controlled by the F number and the focal length, <coughs> just like with a real DSLR. These two parameters basically will determine, uh, this will determine how the radius and this will determine the sharpness, the fall of type. Okay. So just a uh, plain photography, it's uh, exactly the same as in real life photography. These two will determine the blurness or the depth of field. Great. Okay. Now, last question uh, from Mike. Um, are there any V-Ray settings for exterior lighting that you would recommend uh, he looks at? Uh, exterior settings really much resemble the ones that I just showed you because uh, for exterior what we need is really a large amount of samples to cover the entire light environment and this is something that the light cache will give you and the brute force will ensure that it adds on some uh, <coughs> some precision, uh, but uh, you should always work with the physical camera, the exposure control, because you will be lighting either with a dome light or with uh, sun and sky. 
And uh, that's pretty much it. I, I think the exteriors are the easiest to render, but the trick is to set up properly. So I, that's as much as I can say in a few sentences. Okay, okay, that's fair enough, Russell. And Mike, I know you're coming along next week, so perhaps I could introduce you to someone who can uh, put a more, a little bit more meat on those boats, Mike. I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so just now, thank you so much, Vasil. Absolutely fantastic once again. Um, and I'd just like to say to everybody to point out that these two webinars, uh, organised you know, courtesy of the Chaos Group, were in the lead up to our user, the Rhino User Group meeting, which is happening next week in London on the 9th. Um, and you're all, of course, uh, welcome to go and have a look at those details on our website. There is now a full. PDF agenda for the whole day, which has just gone on in the last 24 hours. So if you've looked in the past, I'd suggest looking again because it's it's uh, even a better lineup than it was. Okay, um, uh, th that's really all I'd like to say. You'll, there's going to be an email go out to the attendees where you'll have links to our YouTube channels. I'd suggest subscribing to those channels because this sort of quality uh, material from Vassil, we're we'll look we're going to look to do a lot more of this. Okay, so once again, thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Vassil, and I'll just say goodbye and maybe hope to see, see some of you next week. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye, Vassil. Bye-bye.